friends. This is Gene Shepard, and I have the great pleasure on this, uh, this occasion to read to you one of my favorite stories uh, from uh, Wanda Hickey's Night of Golden Memories, one of my books. And incidentally, this story uh, first appeared in Playboy, and when it did appear, it uh, got a lot of uh, great response and was the winner that year of the Playboy Humor Satire Award. And like they always say on the Johnny Carson show, it's soon to be made into a major motion picture. <laughs> In this case, it's actually true. Anyway, the name of the story is County Fair. And we're all set to go. I struggled frantically to my feet, spilling Pepsi-Cola over the front of my brocade smoking jacket as I flailed about. There wasn't a second to lose, lurching forward, grasping for the knob. I fell heavily over the coffee table. On hands and knees, I scrambled forward, hoping to kill the TV set before it was too late. With a groan, I realized that once again I had lost. The late, late movie curse had struck again. I sat back to accept my fate. I was trapped by one of the worst ever, a bucolic horror that I had taken care to avoid when it first was released by walking on the opposite side of the street from any movie house that played it. In a sky-blue suit and straw skimmer, Dick Hames stood framed against the movie version of the Indiana countryside, dotted with quaint little corn shocks and tinted with lurid oranges and greens, at the entrance to an arch-typical Hollywood state fair. A few minutes later, of course, there was the mandatory old Gramps, perched atop a sulky in the big trotting race, and the girl, rosy-cheeked and beribboned, who watched wall-eyed while Dick soulfully serenaded the Indiana moon. Oh, oh, vainly. Vainly, I watched for a single glimpse of the Indiana fairs that I had actually known. The Indiana fairs that nobody ever makes movies about. But it never came. As Hames warbled on, his eyes twinkling with boyish sincerity, my own grainy movie of a real Indiana fair began to unwind in memory. As the scene opens, Schwartz, Flick, Junior Kissel and I are standing around back of the Sherwin-Williams paint sign in a misty drizzle. We are discussing current events, as was our wont. Schwartz had found a half a can of Copenhagen snuff in the weeds, which we had all tried. After sneezing and gagging violently for 15 minutes, throwing up for 10 minutes, we took up our conversation where it had been interrupted by Schwartz's discovery. The dialogue begins... Quote, my old man says if you ride on the whip too often, it scrambles your brains and you can't think good anymore, said Flick, whose nose was running copiously as a result of the snuff, and it stunts your growth. That must have been what happened to you, Kissel, said Schwartz, spitting out a shred of snuff between his teeth. That's why you're such a shrimp. You must have rode that thing 50 times last year. Kissel, a full half-head shorter than any of us, said nothing at this, realizing, of course, that it was the truth. Well, I don't care what your old man says, Flick, I said. I'm going to ride on a whip and a caterpillar, too. There's so many things that stunt your growth and make you crazy, you might as well do it that way as any other. Everything stunts your growth or makes you crazy. My wisdom, as usual, was profound. The rain drizzled down steadily, carrying with it its full load of blast furnace dust and other byproducts of the steel mills and oil refineries that ringed the town like iron dinosaurs. We wandered down the alley, kicking carnation milk cans into imaginary goals as our conversation dragged on. One thing I'm going to get is one of them red taffy apples, Kissel shouted as he rooted around in somebody's garbage looking for another can to kick. My old man says they stunt your growth, too. That red stuff clamps your teeth together so you can't, you can't grow good, said Schwartz, as he pretended to sink an imaginary basket against a sagging backboard hanging on one of the garages that lined the alley. Yeah, well, your old man should know. He's about three feet tall, Kissel lashed back, cackling fiendishly as Schwartz threw a half-eaten potato at him. The next scene 
is a couple of hours later. My old man, my mother, and my kid brother, Randy, and I are sitting around the kitchen table eating meatloaf, mashed potatoes, and red cabbage. The old man takes a swallow of Blatt's beer, and he says, quote, It doesn't make any difference to me if you want to look at the quilts and the raspberry preserves as long as we get to see the first heat. Then Randy and I'll meet you two after the races, said my mother. She got ready to put the coffee on. My kid brother immediately began to whimper piteously. You can have a tappy apple, she said to him from the stove. He stopped sobbing. One of those red ones, he sniffled. Any color you want. Well, that was enough for him. Well, kid, the old man batted my arm. We'll watch Iron Man Gabruzzi give him hell tomorrow. Iron Man. <laughs> as far as he was concerned, county fairs were dirt track races. All that farm stuff was for the birds. I went to bed happy. My brother and I whispered back and forth about the great stuff that would happen the next day. He was a Ferris wheel nut who would have been glad to spend his entire life going round and round on a big wheel that creaked. You know, come to think, that's as good a way to spend it as any at this point, I say. I'll get that son of a bitch yet. My old man's voice hissed suddenly and venomously going through the darkened house. Whap, bam, whap, go up, whap, whap. My parents' bed squeaked dangerously as he leaped up and down on it, batting away at his old enemy. Every night in the late summer and the early autumn, mosquito squadrons flew miles from the swamp to seek my old man out. The minute the lights were out, they dove to the attack. Flying in tight formations, they strafed again and again. The old man loved every minute of it. Fighting mosquitoes was his favorite sport. He slept with his favorite personal fly swatter, always by his side. He also had a loaded flit gun, but he preferred the swatter. I mean, it was all in the wrist, he used to say. It was more sporting somehow. Whap, 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 bang! Something crashed in the darkness. Whap, whappity! Ah, I got the bastard, he laughed exultantly. The battle was over, till the next hot puff of air brought in reinforcements. Our screens served only to keep the more enormous mosquitoes out of the house, allowing the smaller, lither, angrier types free access. During a second lull between attacks, I drifted off to sleep. Zing! <laughs> Oh, the alarm clock blasted me hysterically into consciousness. Gray Saturday morning light filled the house. The old man cursed and muttered sleepily as my mother padded out into the kitchen in her bathrobe and her curlers to get the scrambled eggs started. An hour later, we were in the Pontiac, on the way to the county fair. The ill-fated Pontiac was an inexplicable interruption in the old man's lifelong devotion to the Oldsmobile. Now, my old man was an Oldsmobile the way other people are Baptists or Methodists or Catholics or Holy Rollers. He later recanted after this episode of backsliding by buying an Olds. Yes, he, he went back and he bought an old station wagon that appealed far more deeply to his flamboyantly masochistic nature. A block or so ahead of us, Ludlow Kissel's battered Nash, loaded with kids and Mrs. Kissel, who weighed 360 pounds and read True Romance. It struggled also towards the fairgrounds. His Nash laid down a steady cloud of blue-white exhaust that hung over Cleveland Street like a destroyer's smoke screen. Junior Kissel peered out of the grimy back window, grinning wildly. Hey, old Lud is sober. He's sober. That makes the second time this summer, said my father as he struggled with the Pontiac, which had started shimmying again. It had bad kingpins. Ten minutes later, we were out on Route 41, bumper to bumper, in the great tangle of cars all headed for the fair. The sun rose higher over the distant steel mills. Steadily, the temperature and humidity rose until the sky was one vast copper sheet. We inched along like an endless possession of ants across a sizzling grill. In the front seat, my mother fanned herself with a paper fan marked Orville Kleber Coal and Ice, reasonable prices. This uh, flat fan was cut, cut in the shape of a lump of coal. It had a wooden handle. She always kept it in the car for days like this. This was before air conditioning. What the hell are you doing, jerk? He was barking at the driver ahead of us. His neck was red from sweat. 
His pongee shirt clung limply to his wiry frame, and his drugstore sunglasses dripped sweat as he glared through the heat waves and exhaust fumes at the idiot ahead. Sleeping Jesus, you're going to park that wreck, or you're going to drive it? It's one of his great witticisms. Little pictures have big ears, my mother intoned automatically, gazing placidly out of her window at a Burma shave sign. The old man's latest curse, one of an endless lexicon, was a new one to me. I filed that away. Sleeping Jesus, that might come in handy in a ball game. Yes, in a ball game with Schwartz. Maybe I can even kill Schwartz with an argument. Well, it was now well past noon, but we were getting close. Far ahead, we could see the enormous billowing cloud of dust that rose from the fairgrounds. Excitement mounted in the Pontiac as we shimmied closer and closer to the scene of action. Suddenly, with a great hissing, scalding roar, the radiator of the car ahead boiled over. Drops of red, rusty sludge streaked down over our windshield and splattered on the hood. Oh, no, for Christ's sake, no! The old man pounded on the steering wheel in rage as the lumbering Buick wheezed to a halt. The Buick ahead of us. The driver, a beet-faced man wearing a stiff blue serge suit and a Panama hat, stumbled out of the car and raised the hood. A white cloud of steam enveloped him from head to toe. God damn it, there goes the first heat. Son of a bitch, we blew it again. Give me a bottle of pop. Suddenly, my mother handed him a bottle of knee-high orange. She passed one back to me and gave my kid brother another. I felt the stinging carbonation sizzle through my nostrils as I guzzled the lukewarm contents. Ahead, the other occupants of the Buick had gathered around the car and were fanning the hood with somebody's white shirt. The steam rose higher into the heavens. The car behind us began honking. Then others joined in. This only bugged the old man even more. Out the window went his, went his head, facing backwards. Shut up, you jerks! He yelled at the line of cars. They honked even louder, of course. The Buick was not the only car giving off steam. Several others had begun to percolate in the heat around us. The crowd ahead had begun to push the Buick off the road like some great wounded whale, and believe me, there is nothing deader than a dead Buick. Finally, we were able to squeeze past the stragglers and once again were moving on towards the fairgrounds. A biplane towing a red and white streamer droned over the line of traffic. Fish, dinner, all you can eat, a dollar sixty-nine, Joe's Diner, Route 6. We were so close now that the sounds of the fair began to drift in over the roar of motors, calliopes bleeding, whistles, merry-go-round music, bells ringing, barkers. Two cops in short-sleeved blue shirts waved the cars in through the main gate and past a cornfield to the jam-packed, rutted parking lot just inside the grounds. Flushed and sweaty, these two cops faced the pressing horde of hissing, steaming, dusty rattle traps with the look of men who are struggling with a totally uncontrollable force that threatens to engulf them at any moment. There's nothing like traffic on a Saturday afternoon outside of fairgrounds in Indiana. Believe me, friends. One cop blew his whistle in short, sharp blasts that matched every breath he took. Quick blasts of a whistle. With his left hand, he seemed to gather the cars in in a steady hooking motion that pushed them on past with his right hand, which moved like a piston in the air, shoving the heaps through the narrow gate. The other cop, taller, and much sadder, stood astride the center line of the asphalt road and glared slowly and deliberately at each car as it rolled past him. The old man, by now barely, barely able to control himself and totally hot under the collar, muttered just barely audible obscenities as we drew abreast of the first cop, just under his breath. What was that, buddy? The cop's voice was level and menacing cutting through the racket of the Pontiac's piston slap like an ice cube going down your back on a hot day. Instantly, an electric feeling of imminent danger whipped through the car. Even my brother stopped whining. Uh, uh, <laughs> pardon me, officer. 
the old man had turned on his innocent voice, which always sounded a little like he was slightly hard of hearing. He stuck his head out the window with exaggerated politeness. Do I hear you call me a son of a bitch, buddy? The tall cop was approaching the side of the car, his eyes piercing the old man like a pair of hot ice picks. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what was that, officer? Uh, <laughs> sir? You heard me. A ham-like hand rested authoritatively on the door handle. A heavy foot clunked solidly on the running board. The lines came to a halt behind us. <laughs> I'm sorry, officer. Uh, what was that you said, uh, sir? You call me a son of a bitch. Oh, heavens no, mercy me. Why, good gracious, you must have heard me sneeze. I am troubled with hay fever. The old man sounded amazingly like an Episcopalian minister. He sneezed loudly into his sleeve as a demonstration. I had seen the old man get out of many a tight squeak before, but this performance, believe me, topped them all. I drank it in, knowing that I was seeing a master at work. My mother said nothing through it all, just looked nervously pathetic, which seemed to help the old man's act. Okay, Buster, just watch your lip, you hear? <laughs> Bless my buttons, officer, I certainly will. Why, yes, indeed. That is fine advice. Heavens to Betsy, I certainly will. <laughs> Thank you for your help, sir. Uh, with a flick of his wrist, the cop waved his hand. The emergency was over. The old man let the clutch out so suddenly that the car jerked heavily twice before lurching forward. An elderly, tail-worn Chevy pickup truck, low in the back, carrying his farmer's driver, his wife, seven kids, and a blue tick hound, had stalled just ahead of us. The old man, out of pure reflex, muttered, Son of a bitch! Realizing he was not yet out of earshot of the cop, he covered it with a loud, juicy sneeze. <coughs> Brack! Bark! It grew hotter and hotter in our little oven as we waited for the farmer to get the Chevy moving again. Oh, at last we got inside the chicken wire fence and passed the little box office where they took the old man's two bucks, the price for an afternoon of untrammeled bliss. My father shoved his hat onto the back of his head while he fished frantically inside his coat pocket for his pack of luckies, a sure sign that he was reaching the boiling point. Holy Christ, would you look at that? Ahead of us, waves of heat rose from a long line of motionless cars that stretched toward the distant parking lot. They had the look of cars that hadn't moved for maybe two hours. People sat on running boards. Fat ladies fanned themselves in the shade. Kids ran in and out past spare tires and around radiators. And guys with push carts selling hot dogs and fudge sickles moved up and down the line doing a roaring business. Two cars ahead of us, a lady was unpacking a lunch basket and spreading bowls of potato salad and jars of pickles on a blanket that she'd laid by the cornfield. A tall man in shirt sleeves and a straw hat chomped contentedly on a sandwich. Would you kids like a peanut butter sandwich? My mother began rummaging in the paper bag that held our lunch. To the left of the line of cars was a high board fence. Now listen to this. There was a high board fence plastered with red and yellow posters. From behind the fence, suddenly surged a tidal wave of deep-throated roaring, followed by clouds of dust and the smell of burning rubber and castor oil. My father hunched over the wheel in excitement. This was his home ground, and he could hardly wait to get in the action. Kaboom! For an instant, everything, everything was blotted out, out of the sun. One of the picnicking ladies stood frozen, holding a bowl of coleslaw in her left hand. The sandwich eater stared heavenward, his mouth poised in mid-chomp. The old man, who had just tilted a can of beer toward the sky, stopped short, foam dribbling down his shirt front, eyes bugging out in amazement and delight. The top of the board fence disintegrated with a stupendous crash. And there, gracefully airborne, high above the line of jalopies, a bright blue racing car with a big number one on its side, arched overhead, trailing smoke. The white-helmeted driver, his green goggles glinting in the sun, looked perfectly calm. It was all in a day's work. One wheel flew crazily ahead of him on a solo fright. Jesus Christ, there goes Iron Man! 
The old man yelled as his favorite member of the racing fraternity disappeared in a cloud of smoke and dust and oil spray into the cornfield off on our right. A great cheer came from behind the shattered fence as the crowd roared its approval of Iron Man's spectacular crack-up. That's what they came to see, and Iron Man gave it to them. As the line of cars inched toward the parking lot, we could see a tow truck dragging Iron Man's lethal Curtis Offy special back into the fray. Iron Man himself, wearing blue coveralls, sat nonchalantly in the cockpit, waving to the crowd. Dirt track racers are not ordinary mortals. I repeat, are not ordinary mortals. Go get him the next heat, Iron Man, bellowed the old man. Boy, ain't he a pisser. This was my father's highest compliment. Ain't he a pisser? Hey, little pitchers have big ears, my mother said again. Well, he is. My father knew a pisser when he saw one. At last, we were parked between an ancient Willie's Knight and a cord owned by a prominent local mafia finger man who ran a mortuary on the side as a kind of tie-in. We'll meet you by the band cell, said the old man. He was in a hurry to get inside the arena. Now, you be careful, my mother told me, as she did so often. You be careful. It was a phrase that ran like a litany through her life. She dragged my kid brother off in the direction of the quilt tent. My old man and I headed for the track, the dirt track. Five minutes later, we were in the stands, immersed in the roaring mob that had come from miles around to cheer the mayhem and carnage on the dirt oval below. I sat hunched next to a gaunt, stringy, hawk-faced farmer who wore a broad-brimmed straw hat low over his eyes. His Adam's apple, big as a turkey egg, bobbed up and down in excitement as he watched the racers. He rolled Bull Durham cigarettes automatically with his left hand as his elbow dug into my ribs. His wife, a large, pink, rubbery woman, breastfed a baby as the racers roared on. Dirt track racing is as much a part of an Indiana County fair as applesauce, pumpkins, and pig judging. Down below us, Iron Man Gabruzzi, back in action, his famous blue Curtis Offie, a little dented from the previous heat, battled it out with his arch-rival Duke Grunion, who drove a battle-scarred yellow blown Ford Special, and in a field of lesser competitors. Round and round they careened, throwing up sheets of yellow dust laced with the blue smoke of burning oil and scorching tires. From time to time a car would leave the pack, slewing sideways, and bounce into the rail, trailing even more smoke than usual. The mob leaped to its feet, bellowing bloodthirstily, and then squatted again, waiting for the next near catastrophe. Over it all, the tinny voice of the PA announcer kept up a running commentary of feeble jokes and trivial observations. Hot dog vendors squeezed up and down the rows, passing out the franks as fast as they could slap them between buns. Oh, the old man. He was in seventh heaven, cheering wildly every time Iron Man moved ahead of Duke Grunion on the far turn to come whistling down the street, his battered old Offenhauser screaming, the 100-mile dirt track championship race is as fiercely fought as any Grand Prix, and in some ways it's far more exciting. The last lap saw Iron Man and Duke battling it out on the home stretch, both sliding high on the banked oval flat out, with Iron Man zooming across the finish line a half-car ahead of Duke. The checkered flag rose and fell. The crowd cheered insanely as Iron Man, waving jauntily from his cockpit, took his victory lap saluting the crowd. He had won 150 bucks for an afternoon's work in the hot sun. We filed out of the stands and headed straight for the bandstand, which was at the center of the fairgrounds. Inside my head, the roaring of the race cars continued, blotting out the sound of the crowd. I would be hearing them in my sleep for at least a week. My nose burned from the gasoline and the alcohol fumes. I gotta have a beer. Racing always made my father very thirsty. We stopped at a stand while he guzzled a bottle of Blatz and listened to the other dirt track fanatics yelling about how great the races had been today. I drank a knee-high orange, my fifth of the day. Already my stomach was starting to ferment. My mother and my kid brother were waiting at the bandstand when we finally showed up. I gotta go to the toilet, whined Randy. My brother always had to go to the toilet, especially when there was no toilet around. 
On either side of us, open sheds filled with rows of soft-eyed cows and jostling farmers stretched off into the distance. Go behind that truck. I'll stand guard, the old man said to my brother. He had handled his situation many times. My brother scooted behind the truck and emerged a couple of minutes later sheepishly. I want to see the pigs, he said. So do I, I seconded him. You know, I always like to look at pigs. And I still do, for that matter. There's something very satisfying about the way a pig looks. They were housed in a tent next to the cows, which were dull, of course, just standing around being cows, row on row. However, the porkers lounged casually, completely at ease with the world. Nobody takes the world more as it is than a good pig. I have never understood why a pig is an animal whose name is used in derision. As in, you pig? Oh, no. A real pig is intelligent and kindly, even benevolent. In fact, a pig is totally with it, to be honest. In the center of the tent, under floodlights, an enormous white hog with black spots graciously accepted the applause of his admirers. Grand champion, the sign read, and above his bed of straw hung a large trailing blue ribbon attached to a blue and gold rosette. Below it was a plaque that read, Big Horus. He had eaten half the ribbon. His tiny red eyes peered out at us jocularly. He was a champion. He knew it. He really had charisma. Lesser pigs grunted and rooted in pens all around him, but Big Horus, he was the star. We stood silently before this regal beast for several minutes, just taking it in. Oh, boy, I'll bet that baby'd make great bacon, my father finally said in a quiet voice. A look of reproach flickered over Horace's mighty face. He heard this as he glanced in our direction, gave my old man a bad look. We moved on with the crowd into the prize goat tent. Photographers were popping flashbulbs around a luxuriant silken-haired angora with a set of wicked-looking horns. Behind him stood a short, fat 4-H girl wearing a green beret and holding up another blue ribbon. The goat tent was among the gamier exhibits, but exciting. Goats, you know, are unpredictable, and from time to time one would try to climb out and go after some kid's taffy apple. Goats always have fancy names. I don't know whether you have ever seen goats at fairs, but these are the kind of names they have. This one that we were looking at was Prince Bernadotte Charlemagne de Alexandre of Honeydale Farms. The 4-H girl stared solemnly at the cameras while the bulbs popped on. The goat just chewed, spit once in a while, looked bored. We wandered around with the dusty crowds, looking at turkeys, ducks, rabbits, sheep, guinea pigs, and chickens. Oh, by the way, it was in the chicken tent that an enigmatic event took place. In one corner, a heavy-set lady wearing a green shawl sat on a camp chair next to a large, fancy cage containing a single, white, efficient-looking chicken. Atop the cage was a sign, Esmeralda Knows. Folks, would you care to have Esmeralda tell your fortune? Yeah, yeah, I want my fortune told. My kid brother went into high gear. The chicken hopped around in the cage and clucked knowingly. How much is it? asked my mother warily. Only a dime, just ten cents to learn the little boy's fortune. The chicken pecked at the cage, waiting to go to work. My mother reached into her carry-all with the picture of Carmen Miranda on it, fished out a dime, and handed it to my brother, who grabbed it eagerly. Put the dime in the slot, little boy, and watch the chicken tell your fortune. My brother walked up to the cage, his face inches away from the chicken's beak, the two stared at each other for a long moment. A small crowd was beginning to gather. He dropped the dime into the slot on the side of the cage. At that, a ladder dropped from the roof inside the cage. The chicken scurried up the ladder, rung by rung, clucking madly. At the top of the ladder was a box containing folded slips of paper. The chicken picked one out with his beak, hopped back down the ladder, eyes rolling wildly, and dropped the slip of paper into a chute, thereby releasing a half dozen grains of corn. Cluck, 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 cluck. It gulped them down hungrily. There, Esmeralda has told your fortune, this lady said to my brother. I noticed she had a mustache. 
The slip of paper had dropped into a small tray outside the cage. My brother grabbed it and read the message aloud. Uh, you are... Uh, you are unwise in your investments. Care in the future will ensure financial success. <laughs> my mother laughed uproariously. <laughs> and my brother <laughs> looked at her with a bad look and said, What's the matter? My mother laughed again. Esmeralda was right. You spent your entire allowance last week on fudge sickles all in a half an hour. You see, she's right. That chicken knows. My brother glared angrily at Esmeralda. Now there's something I gotta see, said my father. Wait till you see this. I read about it in the paper. What now? asked my mother as we stared after him. She knew better than the fight the inevitable. Harry Gertz saw it yesterday, and he said you wouldn't believe it. Well, said my mother. If Harry Gert said that, it certainly must be something. Harry is a man of great judgment, right? What do you mean by that? My father shot back. Harry Gertz was one of the old man's bowling buddies, famed throughout the county for his collection of incredibly gross jokes. My mother didn't even answer. Anyway, I want to see it. He went over to a dozing cop and asked him directions. My father came back, beaming. Okay, here we go. Follow me. We did. And a couple of minutes later, we were waiting in front of another tent. Will you see this? You won't believe it. Will you see this? My father rubbed his hands together in anticipation. The crowd snaked into the tent in a long line. Finally, we were inside. Big floodlights hung from the tent poles. In the middle of the sawdust floor, there was a roped-off area. What is it? My mother asked as soon as she got a look at what was on the platform. What do you mean, what is it? What do you mean, what is it? Stupid, can't you read the sign, you dummy? A sign hung over the astounding object that had moved even Harry Gertz to speechless wonder. The crowd stood in reverent silence. Occasionally, someone snapped a picture with a brownie, hoping that there was enough light to enable him to preserve this magnificent exhibit forever in his book of memories. The sign, hand-lettered in gilt on fake parchment, was draped with an American flag. And the sign read, This giant 47-pound, 10-ounce Indiana pumpkin bearing a striking likeness to our beloved President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was grown by Homer L. Seastrunk of RFD2, New Jerusalem, Indiana. Mr. Seastrunk plans to present this pumpkin to President Roosevelt at the White House in Washington, D.C. How do you like that? How do you like that, my father said softly as the four of us stood before this great pumpkin. Someone behind me muttered angrily, that nut is ruining the country. I know what I'd do with that pumpkin if I got in the White House with that damn Roosevelt. Shh! Several indignant patriots hissed back, shh! There was no doubt that this was one of the high points of the fair. Another sign said that Mr. Seastrunk himself would give a personal appearance at 3 p.m. to give a short talk on how he figured God had created that pumpkin in honor of the president. He would also give free autographs. He didn't mention whether God would, too. I told you this was worth seeing. Isn't this something? said my father as he wound one of the knobs on his trusty camera. Now, how would you like to go next door? Here's a treat for you kids. How would you like to see the world's biggest cheese? Now, the same cheese, I have no doubt, has been on exhibit at every fair ever attended in America. It wasn't much to look at. When you've seen one, you've seen them all, actually. Even if it weighs two tons, a sign read over this cheese, the milk from 2,000 cows for one full year was required to make this cheese. It would make over 422,000 cheese sandwiches. Now, this is the kind of stuff that really got to the old man. This is what the old man thought of as great art. He snapped more pictures and walked all the way around the cheese, examining it from every angle so he could tell Sherby all about it when he got back in the office on Monday. All it did, this cheese, was make my kid brother hungry again. It was late in the afternoon now, 
and the crowd was really warmed up, moving in straggly columns around huge black wheel tractors, cultivators, threshing machines, and other agricultural exotica. Salesmen, the collars of their shirts open, ties hanging limply, shouted over bullhorns as we wandered dazedly amid the shuffling throng, kicking up bread crusts and paper cups as we eddied on. I'm hungry, my brother droned, his voice barely audible above the uproar. Now you've just gone. You'll have to wait, said my mother, pushing the damp hair back off her forehead. I don't have to go. I'm hungry. Randy never gave up. You heard what your mother said, my father got into the act. I said I'm hungry. You're what? You've had three taffy apples. You've had four hot dogs and two root beers. That's enough for a while. I want a pickle. As it happened, we were passing a stand where a guy in a red vest and a white chef's hat was selling giant dark green pickles from barrels. People really eat strange things at county fairs. I want one, too, I said. So, of course, we all bought pickles and wax paper and rejoined the moiling mob. My pickle must have weighed two pounds. Every time I bit into it, it squirted down the front of my shirt and out of my tennis shoes. It was getting dark now and fifty times more exciting as the bright lights began to flash around and caught everybody's face. I washed down the tart, puckery taste of the pickle with some cold buttermilk from a paper cup with a picture on it of a red cow wearing a green hat. My knees had begun to ache from the endless trudging through sawdust and over piles of debris. On either side of us, a sparkling ribbon of spinning yellow wheels, blue-white neon lights, and hot orange flames under cooking grills stretched to the horizon. Guys with leather jackets and great mops of carefully combed, greasy hair ranged through the crowd, looking for fights and girls. On a high platform, two blondes, wearing silver helmets, sat on the saddles of enormous, bright red Harley Davidsons. They gunned the motors, definitely, sending thin blue exhaust smoke into the crowd that stood around the platform with glazed eyes and gaping mouths. The look of a crowd at an Indiana fair with their mouths hanging open is one that, once you've seen it, are always reminded of a school of fish. Defying death, every second, defying death. Every second, straight from the world championships in Paris, France, Melba and Bonnie stare to the very jaws of eternity, yelled the barker. Broom, broom, they gunned the Harleys. Another cloud of acrid smoke drifted out over the mob. The barker spieled on. There is time for just one more big show tonight, just one more. Never in your life have you seen anything to equal the Devil Ride. Broom, broom, broom. Beginning in just one minute, in just 60 seconds, beautiful Melba and lovely Bonnie stare into the jaws of death. Broom, broom. The two blondes, thin-faced and pallid, peered out from under their spectacular helmets, chewing gum steadily as they gunned their Harleys. I gotta see that. That act was designed for my old man. I gotta see this. Anything that had to do with roaring mortars and crash helmets hit him right in the vitals. Added to the fact that these were skinny blonde women, another weakness, and you had big-time showbiz, as far as he was concerned. This was as far as it could go. This was Oscar stuff. With a couple of final provocative roars, the two raced down the ramp and disappeared through a doorway outlined in yellow and a string of colored light bulbs festooning a blood-red devil's face with green eyes. And in the distance you could hear him still, broom, broom, broom. We followed close behind my father as he elbowed his way through the sweaty throng of daredevil fans to the head of the line inside the tent. We found ourselves standing at the rim of a circular pit, ten or fifteen feet deep. The noise was deafening. The wooden floor vibrated and creaked under our feet. The air was thick with burning gasoline. And down in the pit, the two motorcycles boomed round and round, chasing each other madly in faster and faster circles, rising up the curved walls until they were riding almost horizontally under the chicken wire that separated the Harleys from the crowd. A white-faced, blue-veined minister, his high collar spotted with ketchup, stood next to us in tense excitement. Kids ran wildly in and out of the crowd, throwing peanut shells at the, at the riders as they screamed round and round in their tight spiral. 
The old man peered down into the maelstrom, pounding the rail in excitement. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! As the motorcycles accelerated faster and faster. Defying gravity, others, is their specialty. They are defying gravity itself. These specially built Harley Davidsons, Melba and Bonnie, will now perform a death-defying feat never before seen in the United States. This is deadly and could result in a catastrophe, shouted the voice on the PA system over the racket. Down in the gloom of the hell pit, the exhaust trailed smoke as the bicycles rode abreast. Melba and Bonnie will now... Change motorcycles at top speed! The crowd hunched forward with expectancy. Even the kids were quiet. The thunder of the motorcycles had reached the point where no more sound could be endured. The whole structure, the floor, the guy wires, the back teeth, everything vibrated to the scream of the Harleys. Down in the pit there was a quick shuffling of bodies, and it was done. For Christ's sake, how do you like that? I wouldn't have believed it, said the old man to no one in particular. The minister, his black hat hanging at a rakish angle, applauded frantically. Oh, what an act. What a fantastic moment. Once again, we were out on the midway, 50 cents poorer but infinitely richer in worldly experience, something we would never, ever forget again. My mother, who was eating a piece of watermelon, said plaintively, I haven't seen the quilts yet. I want to go on a Ferris wheel whined my brother for the twenty-eighth time. I thought you were going to see him when we went to the races, those damn quilts, said the old man, ignoring the kid brother for the twenty-eighth time. We went to the cookie tasting instead. The what? The cookie tasting, over by where they were having the artistic flower arranging. The old man said nothing and headed for a three-story orange face that laughed madly under a sign that read, Fun House. He hoped that by not answering she would forget those damn quilts. Mrs. Wimple has a quilt in this year, she persisted. Bernice Wimple from the club, she's got a quilt in there. It's the rose and duck pattern. My mother belonged to a dartball club that staged mysterious contests in the church basement every Thursday. Bernice Wimple played for the Laporte, Indiana Bearcats, a legendary dartball team in the church league. It's a duck and rose quilt, she continued, wiping a watermelon seed off her chin with a paper napkin that said, Have fun, in blue letters over an American flag. My, my father, realizing that he'd have to say something, stalled for time. What the hell kind of quilt is that? A rose and duck quilt. She says, Well, it's an artistic quilt that has two roses and two ducks and the face of Thomas Jefferson on it, done in cross-stitch. Oh, Thomas Jefferson and two ducks and a couple of roses? Well, i got to see that, said my father sarcastically. After a ten-minute search, we finally found the tent with the quilt exhibit under strings of yellow light bulbs. The quilts were tacked up all around, stretched tight, so that the designs could be admired respectfully from behind a rope by the motley throng of art lovers. Mrs. Wimple's quilt was among them. We stood before the giant portrait of Thomas Jefferson, surrounded by ducks and roses. He looks a little cross-eyed to me, the old man observed accurately. Well, I think it's pretty. Mrs. Wimple worked seven years on it. It's pretty. We peered at the third-place ribbon it sported and moved on to look at the others. The winning quilt had a stand all by itself, the winner. It bore a spectacular portrait of Old Faithful on a yellow background, framed by purple mountains and surrounded by a herd of animals, a moose, an elk, two bighorn sheep, a bunny with pink eyes, and what appeared to be a hippopotamus. Above this scene, in old English style, red, white, and blue letters, was the following profundity. It was done in cross-stitch. The beauty of our glorious land is surpassed only by God's blessed handiwork. Roswell T. Blount, LLD. Now that's what I call pretty, said my father solemnly, reading the inscription. We all agreed it was very pretty. Most of the quilts ran heavily to such patriotic themes, except for the one that had a ribbon for unusual subject, honorable mention. It was a full-color portrait done on a background of green grass. 
the eyes of the subject staring beadily out from under his familiar cap stopped the old man dead in his tracks. The old man looked at it from under his eyes, glazed over with surprise. His mouth hung open for a moment, and then he said, Well, I'll be damned. I'll be a son of a bitch. He stood in awe before this transcendent work of art. I never thought I'd see Luke Appling on a quilt. Luke Appling, sure enough, it was a ruddy likeness of old Luke himself, the foul ball king of the American League. My father, my father, a lifelong Chicago White Sox fan, was visibly moved by this portrait. His favorite shortstop of all time. Under the picture streamed the legend woven in golden thread, battling Luke Appling, always first in our hearts. You know, parenthetically, I wonder what a genuine Luke Appling quilt would go for today in the chic high camp boutiques along 3rd Avenue in Manhattan. It would be an astronomical price. Let's go, all you great lovers, all you he-men, barked a man in a purple derby at the next concession. Let's see what kind of man you really are, right? Let's see what kind of man you are, all you he-men. Yes, sir, show that beautiful girl you're with just what kind of a man you really are. Here you are, let's go. Here you are, here you are. Here's your chance to get up and really ring the bell. Everybody wins. It's a good, healthful exercise, and everybody wins. Ring the bell. I said everybody wins. All right, you lovers, show that little lady what kind of muscles you really got. Ring the bell. We joined the circle of gawkers at the foot of a 30-foot-high pole that had a wire running up its length with a big gong at the top. At the bottom was a round metal plate. The pole, candy-striped, red and white, was marked with gradations beginning at the bottom. They read, Casper Milk Toast, Ladies Division, Better Eat Your Wheaties, Average, Not Bad, Watch Out for This Guy, and way at the top, Wow, a real He-Man, a huge, rosy-cheeked, curly-haired tractor driver type wearing Sears Roebuck pants and a checkered cowboy shirt, stepped into the arena. Let's see how the young man swings. Look at those shoulders, folks. Look at those arms. Swing the hammer nice and smooth, son. Hit it right on a button. Let's see you ring the bell. The barker handed this behemoth a big mallet. His friends jeered and snorted noisily in derision. Beat the hell out of it, Caleb. Come on, beat it, Caleb, one yelled. Oh, come on, he can't make it past the ladies, Mark. He ain't got no lead in his pencil. Come on. The crowd snickered contemptuously. Caleb grabbed the handle and swung wildly. Ka-thunk! The iron weight rose feebly up the cable and fell back with a clunk. No wonder you can't make out with Minnie, hooted one of his friends. <laughs> Caleb spat in his hands and he swung again. The hammer whistled through the air. Ka-thunk! The weight rose a little higher this time, almost reaching the average mark, halfway up the pole. Caleb looked thoughtful as the distant sound of the merry-go-round calliope switched from Alexander's ragtime band to the Valkyrie. It was indeed a Wagnerian moment, the twilight of the gods, in fact. He peered upwardly at the gong, which now seemed thousands of feet in the air. He kicked the dirt like a batter, digging in at the batter's box, wiped his hands on his trousers. He spit mightily and once again grabbed the mallet. His biceps rippled under the tight-fitting cowboy shirt. Dark circles of sweat stained the armpits. His back arched. This time, he swung the hammer from the ground, then up in a great swinging arc. ka The metal weight drifted casually up the wire, slowed and stopped at Casper Milk Toast. Man, you better quit before that thing don't move at all. That son of a bitch is going to come and beat you on the head in a minute. Caleb dropped the hammer, his face bathed in sweat and red from humiliation. He paid the barker and left the arena a broken man. I had a suspicion. If there was ever a sucker for that kind of thing, it was my old man. I think I'm going to try whacking that thing, he whispered. I'm going to try that. Now, don't make a fool of yourself. My mother was always afraid of making a fool of herself or himself or anybody in the family. And especially with the old man, she had good reason to be. Oh, come on, just for the fun. I mean, what the hell? All right, you lovers. All right, you saw Cousin Caleb. 
You saw Cousin Caleb from Rushville, Indiana. Get all the way up to average. Now let's see how you can do. Ring the bell, ring the bell. Who can ring the bell and everybody wins a prize? As Caleb snarled at the Greek chorus of hisses and boos from his corn-liquored buddies, the old man stepped into the clearing without a word, gave the guy a quarter, grabbed the hammer, and swung. Cut thwack! He didn't hit it with anywhere near the thump that Caleb got into her, but zip on The iron weight raced to the top and rang the bell so loud it could be heard a block away. You see that, Caleb? That guy's got lead in his pencil. <laughs> this guy can do it. The noisy nasal bray of rustic wit opened up again on poor Caleb. A little man wins a box of genuine Swiss chocolate bonbons. All you got to do is have a good swing. Who's going to win the next prize? All you lovers, step right up. My father, stunned at his totally unprecedented victory, grabbed the box of chocolates amid the applause of the rabble. The last we saw of Caleb was the hammer rising and falling at two bits of swing, being milked by that barker for every cent he owned. He was probably ready to go home and sell the farm and come back again and try her. This moment was to become a sacred gem in the family archives. The more it was told, the greater the feat became. Caleb grew into Paul Bunyan, and the old man's hammer swing rose to Olympian proportions. And it wasn't until I was 16 that I read an article in Popular Mechanics and discovered that the barker operated the thing with his foot. The old man fortunately never found out. As we moved from one marvel to the next, my brother and I began to list heavily to port. We hadn't stopped eating since we stepped onto the fairgrounds. Homemade popcorn balls, red and white and blue, made by the 4-H. Girl Scout cookies, French fries, boiled corn on the cob, dripping butter, knee-high orange and Hires root beer, peanuts, pumpkin pie, hot dogs, pickles, American Legion auxiliary crullers, moose angel food cake, taffy apples, lemonade, and a thousand free samples, including Purina chick chow, which my brother and I both ate avidly. Adding to this was the real specialty of the Indiana Fair, any Indiana Fair, homemade black walnut chocolate fudge, displayed in thick fly-crawling slabs at stands operated by beaming Kiwanians wearing funny hats and badges. We also scoffed down something called uh, vanilla angel breath, was a peculiarly native candy, an airy concoction so unbelievably sweet that a bite-sized portion would rot teeth at 50 paces. A fundamental ground rule of the county fair was that kids could have anything they wanted to eat, just this once. Steadily, we chewed our way toward Armageddon. Barkers on both sides hawked everything from horse collars to mystic Mohegan Indian squaw corn cure. We paused briefly while my old man hurled lumpy baseballs at battered wooden milk bottles, his blood rising visibly as the balls bounced off the canvas at the rear of the tent. Other athletes strained and grunted, their hard-earned cash winging into the canvas with dull thuds. A shelf held the possible booty, what you could win. Cerise Cupid dolls with enormous red feather fans, stuffed pandas, shiny china panthers with clocks in their stomachs, souvenir ashtrays in the shape of mother-of-pearl toilets. Yes, it was a veritable king's ransom. These were prizes. The proprietor, a short, round man with a gray chin, played them like rainbow trout. You got a nice arm there, son, nice arm. Now, let's see you lay it in there. Show that little lady how the big leaguers do it. Look at that arm, folks. Look at it. He's tossing a knuckler. Did you see that knuckleball? Three, three balls for a quarter. How about you, little lady? Try your luck. While my father was winding up, the man handed three baseballs to a skinny girl about 11. She quickly bowled over three milk bottles and still had a ball left. Pick any prize you want, little lady, any prize. The sweating yahoos threw with renewed vigor. Dollar bills cascading across the counter. The 11-year-old picked a cupid down and left. It wasn't until the next day that we found out that she was the daughter of the guy who ran the joint. It was another fixed game. We saw him in Joe's diner eating shredded wheat. With our money, it was getting late. Our feet were coated with chewing gum and popcorn, and we were covered with a thick layer of finely powdered yellow clay. 
I knew that somewhere on the ground, Schwartz and Flick and Kissel were doing things that they would lie to me about the next day. Now we were deep in the heart of the thrill ride section of the fair. The Ferris wheel reached high up into the dark sky, its spokes outlined in colored red light bulbs, jerking upward and stopping and jerking and jerking upward again. It loomed over us like a huge illuminated snowflake. I want to go on a Ferris wheel, Randy whined. This time he was not to be denied. My father bought a ticket from the man in the little booth. Off my brother went through the turnstile and into a wobbly car the color of a grape. A minute later, he was laughing down at us and sticking his tongue out as he was swept ecstatically up into the night. Every few seconds, the wheel would stop and unload a car. We stood around and waved every time he went past, his tongue sticking out further and further. Finally, the grape car stopped at the bottom. We could see the attendant in blue overalls swing the gate open. He seemed to be arguing with the occupant. The attendant finally hollered out to the guy in the box office. Hey, Jake, this goddamn kid won't get out. Oh, for Christ's sake, what now, the old man muttered. Now you get out. You had enough, said the attendant. Ah! The attendant reached in and wrenched him out, fighting and kicking every inch of the way. It was like pulling a tooth out of that car. My father took over the battle, dragging him out into the midway. I want to go on again, he screamed, but to no avail. The big wheel started up without him as we moved on to the next attraction, Randy struggling at every step trying to get back to the Ferris wheel. We tried to hurry past a merry-go-round, swarming with little kids and mothers, but it was no use. Randy threatened to throw himself under it if he didn't get to ride on it. I stood with my father as he whirled round and round beside my mother, sitting on a black swan with a yellow beak. He tried to do a handstand as the man on the flying trapeze played over and over and over and over again. After the sixth ride, we managed to pull him out. He emerged slightly pale, but still game. We ate a red candy apple apiece, thus setting the stage for total disaster. My father never went on rides. This was an unspoken rule, unless they were real gut busters. He went for the biggies. He had ventured unflinchingly onto roller coasters in other days, so violent as to turn away strong men quaking in fear. He spotted one of his old favorites, an evil contraption known as the Whirligig Rocket Whip. Now, he had been warned of its presence long before we arrived on the scene. Screams of horror and the flashing light of an emergency ambulance led us finally to the killer ride of the mall. They were carrying away victims by the dozens by the time the old man arrived on the scene. At every fair or amusement park, there is one ride that is the yokel, equivalent of the main bull ring in Madrid. This is where callow-faced youths and gorilla-armed ice men proved their virility to their admiring women. The Whirligig Rocket Whip was a classic of its kind. It consisted of two bullet-shaped cars, one yellow, one red, attached to the ends of rotating arms. It revolved simultaneously clockwise and up and down, at the same time, the individual cars rotated in their own orbits. The old man, spotting the rocket whip, strained forward like a fire horse, smelling smoke. Are you sure you should go on that? My mother held back. Ah, come on, it'll do the kids good. Blow the stink off them. She didn't answer, just gazed up in fear at the mechanical devil that was now about to take on passengers. The yellow car rested near the ground, its wire mesh door invitingly open. He bought three tickets from the operator, who sat near the turnstile in a rocking chair, the control lever at his side. Let's go, kids. Come on. This is going to be fun. We piled into the car. Now, the interior was simplicity itself. Two hard metal seats and a bar that clamped down over the laps of the occupants so that their bodies didn't become actually dismembered. We sat stationary for a long moment. High above us, the occupants of the red car gazed down at us, upside down, waiting for Thor's hammer to descend. The man yanked the lever, and it began. Slowly at first, we began to spin. The landscape outside our wire mesh cage blurred as we gained speed. We leaped skyward, up, up, up. 
pause briefly at the top of the arc at what looked like thousands of feet above ground level and then plunge straight down. Just as we neared the earth, we were whipped upward again. By this time, the car, caught by enormous forces, had begun spinning centrifugably on its own. We were trapped in a giant cream separator. This was an enormous wearing blender. There were brief flashes of dark sky, flashing lights, gaping throngs, my old man's rolling eyes, his straw hat sailing around the interior of the car. Oh, 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 for Christ's sake, he yelled. A shower of loose change, quarters, nickels, dimes, pennies, sprayed out of his pockets, filled the car for an instant, and were gone out into the night. Oh, Jesus Christ, no, no, he yelled again as his brown and white marbled wherever fountain pen with his name on it, given to him by the bowling team, flew out of his pocket and disappeared into the night. Higher and higher we flew, swooping low to scream upward again. My kid brother, Chalk White, whimpered piteously. I clung onto the iron bar, certain that my last hour had finally arrived. My head thumped the back of the car steadily as it spun. Ain't this fun, kids? Ain't this fun? Oh, God, what a ride! Oh! shouted the old man, sweating profusely. He made a grab for his hat as it sailed past him. Wave to Ma, kids! Wave to Ma! There she is! It was then that the operator turned the power on full. Everything that had gone before was just a warm-up. Our necks snapped back as the rocket whip accelerated. I was not touching the seat now at any moment. I was airborne, jackknifed over the bar. I saw that one of my shoes had been wrenched off my foot. At that moment, with no warning, my kid brother let it all go. His entire accumulation of goodies, now marinated and pungent, gushed out in the great geyser. The car spun crazily. The air was filled with atomized spray of everything he'd ingested the last 24 hours. And down we swooped. Oh, my God, my new pudgy shirt! Soaked from head to foot, the old man struggled frantically in his seat to get out of the line of fire. It was no use. I felt it coming, too. I closed my eyes, and the vacuum forces of outer space just dragged us all out of me like a vast suction pump. From a million miles away, I was being sucked dry. I heard my old man shouting something, but it didn't matter. All I knew was that if I didn't hold onto that bar, it was all going to be over. We gradually spun to a stop, and finally the iron mesh door opened. Oh, my God. My feet touched the blessed earth. On rubbery legs, clinging weakly together, the three of us tottered past the turnstile as other victims were clamped into the torture chamber we had just left. Great ride, eh, folks? I left you on a little longer, because I could see the kids was really enjoying it, said the operator, pocketing the last of my father's change as we passed through the turnstile. Oh, oh God, thanks. It sure was great said the old man with a weak smile, a bent cigarette hanging from his lips. He had always judged a ride by how sick it made him. The nausea quotient of the rocket whip was about as high as they come. We sat on a bench for a while to let the breeze dry off the old man's shirt, and so that our eyes would get back into focus. From all around us we could hear the whoops and hollers of people going up and down and sideways on the other rides, there was one across from the rocket whip that my kid brother, who had great recuperative powers, had to go on. We didn't have the strength to stop him. It was a big barrel made out of some kind of shiny metal that spun around like a cocktail shaker on its side. The people were screaming and yelling. Their skirts were flying up. Their shoes were flying off. And Randy loved it. We hung around and waited until they threw him out. It was late now and getting a little chilly. It seemed like we had been at the fair for, oh, about a month. We sat on the bench while the crowd trudged past us, chewing hot dogs, lugging jars of succotash that they had bought at the exhibits, twirling sticks with little yellow birds on the ends of strings that you could hear whistling over the calliope on the merry-go-round, wearing souvenir Dr. Bodley's iron nerve tonic sun visors, carrying drunken cousins who had hit the apple jack since early morning, wheeling, reeking babes, smeared with cake pablum and chocolate, long-legged, skinny, yellow dogs with their tongues hanging out, kept running back and forth and barking. It had been an unforgettable day. Sure feels good just to sit for a while, said my mother. She took off one shoe and dumped out some popcorn. 
The old man didn't say anything. The unlit cigarette still in his mouth, he sat and watched the crowd move on with his hat pushed back on his head. And we sat like that for about 15 minutes, getting our wind back. Did you feel a drop of rain? My mother looked up at the black sky and held out her hand. The old man looked up. Nah, you must be sweat. That's probably sweat. I felt a drop, I said, sticking my hand out. The only one who didn't stick his hand at was my kid brother, who didn't give a damn whether it rained or not. He just sat, squatting at the end of the bench, and went back to whining, which he always did when there was nothing else to do. Stop that, you're getting on my nerves, said my mother, poking him in the ribs to shut him up. I'm tired. He had that high-pitched, irritating sound that he was so good at. You know, I think it is raining, the old man made it official. People started to hold newspapers over their heads and duck under awnings and into tents. Well, you might as well call the day, announced the old man as he stood up and stuck his shirt tail back into his pants. Let's head for the car. We were a long way from the parking lot, which was over on the other side of the racetrack about four miles away. We slogged doggedly through drifting mountains of candy wrappers, cigar butts, apple cores, and cow flop, past tents full of canned lima beans, crocheted doilies, sweetheart pillows, and gingerbread men, past shooting galleries and harvester machines, and finally, as the rain was really beginning to come down hard, we reached the car. We joined the procession of mud-spattered vehicles, inching painfully bumper to bumper toward the distant highway. You know, I think the fair was even better than usual this year. My father said the same thing every year. Yes, the quilts were better this year, my mother agreed. I think Bernice should have won the at least second prize, though. The quilt that won wasn't that good. Oh, well, you know, there's always a lot of politics in that damn quilt business. The old man always figured there was politics in everything. I'm hungry, Randy was at it again. We'd had an empty stomach ever since the rocket whip. He'd been drained clean, but his stomach had been pumped out. We'll have meatloaf sandwiches when we get home, said my mother, wiping the steam off the inside of the windshield with her handkerchief so she could see out. A right guard commercial featuring two French foreign legionnaires hiding behind a sand dune snapped me back into the real world. Ah, ah! I was back in the real world. I glanced at my watch. My God, it was twenty after four. Another goddamn night shot in front of the television set. The closing credits of the movie came on, superimposed over the never, never dream world of Dick Hames State Fair. Indiana State Fair, what a laugh. I stood up, my knees cracking like twin castanets. That's an occupational hazard of late, late movie addiction. Hobbling over to the set, I reached down and snapped it off. The picture quickly shrank to a tiny dot in the middle of the screen. It lingered for a moment, glowing at me accusingly as though I had killed it, and then disappeared. <sighs> I was ready to hit the sack. Or was I? No, there was something to do, something I had to do. What was it? I felt a peculiar, unnameable yearning from deep within me, a gnawing, a gnawing emptiness. There I was, sitting in the middle of New York City. And I felt this gnawing. I smacked my lips. And suddenly...